Blog Talk Radio. That's right, you're listening to Paranormal Now. I'm your host, Alan B. Smith, and I invite you to join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs. Um, coming right up is uh, Reed Summers, but first I have Ken Sherry on to give us a few updates on, on his work and his investigations in ufology. Um, and you don't want to miss our interview with Reed Summers, um, because we are going to discuss the alien story that he has to share about dire messages for humanity, and I really think you want to hear this one out. Um, so please follow us on Facebook, as usual, facebook.com slash paranormal now radio, or on Instagram at paranormal now. Uh, please leave your uh, comments and feedbacks. I'd love to, uh, to hear your thoughts. Uh, you can also go to the website and teleport your thoughts as well, um, or just comment anywhere on any of our social media platforms, including YouTube. Um, to call in live tonight and ask our guest, Reed Summers, a question, please call 657 657- 383-0829. Again, to call in, the number is 657-383-0829. Welcome again to Paranormal Now. Um, so let's uh, let's get our first uh, guest on here. I'm just going to make sure we've got our, our wires crossed correctly because uh, we we're a little late in getting Reed hooked up into the studio. Um, so I'm just going to bring Ken on here real fast. Ken, Ken, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, All right, great. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for jumping in, Ken. You know, wasn't sure how the show was going to flow. It looks like we've got Reed on, um, but I know you and I were talking, and uh, there were a couple of things that you, we didn't get to discuss about your book, The Stephenville UFO, which traces your story um, fictionally of your investigation into the Stephenville UFO incident in 2008. Uh, yeah, so so what was it that you wanted to share with us about the characters that we didn't get to talk well, to you about before? Well, even though it is billed as a uh, uh, work of fiction, it's uh, pretty thinly veiled because uh, most of the characters in the book are actually based on very real individuals. And two of the key um, secondary uh, f- uh, figures are... Um, uh, a gentleman I met who is most, most interesting and is very likely the original smoking man that you see uh, in the X-Files. Um, fascinating background. He had uh, uh, become a member of the OSS, which was the forerunner to the CIA during World War II, and worked very uh, closely with uh, General MacArthur. And apparently they viewed at least three downed ships during the war uh, that were shot down accidentally by uh, artillery or uh, fire, uh, um, the gunfire or, um, or or weather conditions, and um, and viewing the craft, these downed craft, they they did um, see alien bodies and so forth, and so that is how he um, got introduced to the most. Uh, uh, secret uh, <laughs> aspect our government, uh, you know, programs that our government has. But at any rate, I knew him as an older man, and uh, he had spent many years, obviously, um, uh, pursuing uh, uh, this, uh, you know, these projects. One of the things that he told me was that he was a member of uh, a three-man uh, panel that made the final approvals for the black budget uh, programs. And that one year, um, uh, there was a four-star general sitting there, and the uh, the appropriation that they were asking for was just so huge that none of the three gentlemen on the panel would agree to, to sign it. They said, you know, this is just so much money, and we don't know where it's going, and so, uh, you know, until we know how the money's being spent, where it's going, we're not going to prove it. At any rate, you said they took uh, the three of them to this enormous hangar. You wouldn't tell me where. But when they went inside, there were all sizes of UFOs, uh, flying saucers, and uh, he called them flying saucers. 
And the general turned and said, that's where the money's going. Well, this was in the early 60s, and so we have had a functioning uh, secret uh, space program uh, at least since the early 60s. And so, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I think that to bring it forward uh, to current politics, uh, um, you know, of course, that several uh, presidents have hinted at their interest in UFOs mm -hmm. and been rebuffed, uh, uh, Clinton and Obama and so forth. But, sure. Uh, yeah. I believe that Trump uh, probably has a pretty good handle on it <clears throat> and that his constant uh, mentioning of a space force is just sort of a uh, caution to the powers that be that uh, – you know, <laughs> I, I might be the one to make the disclosure here. And so uh, I don't think it's just empty rhetoric. But, but at any rate, uh, m many of the real unknowns that we see in the sky are our own uh, back-engineered uh, products. So yeah. uh, just well, imagine I, look, where I think that we've would be, been. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be fascinating if, if Trump really did know something and he's trying to push the envelope, but I also do, you know, knowing his style, you know, he likes to go big and bombastic, right? So maybe he's thinking, well, I want to expand the military. I want us to look more powerful, but I can't really think of a new military branch to invent except for a space force. Um, I mean, eventually we are moving out to space. I mean, there's going to be competition between multiple nations, so, I mean, it does seem like a logical, whether there's, you know, ET involved or not, it does sort of seem like a logical step eventually, you know? Well, uh, I think that uh, the uh, elite uh, who've been chosen to be in these programs have already uh, ventured out into the cosmos, uh, without a doubt. Uh, there's no, it's not logical to assume, uh, to believe that, um, all these trillions that are missing that have gone into these um, programs mm -hmm. uh, have not produced results. I mean, after all, this gentleman that I knew uh, saw, you know, these working flying saucers, he called them. And um, I don't think that they've uh, spent the last uh, uh, 60 years or so just mm -hmm. flying around in our atmosphere, so uh, just, just, me, just the, taking cru <laughs> yeah, joy rides, <laughs> just cru cruising around, scaring yeah. the populace, just does it, you know, that's just not human nature. And so, uh, you know, I, according to my sources, three scientists who worked on uh, back engineering at S4 uh, there in Area 51 and in other places, uh, you know, we've had anti-gravity and, uh, you know, functional um, spacecraft for quite a while. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they just don't want to disclose this uh, and let go of the power that goes along with, with having that. Just imagine uh, the wealth that uh, sailing to the new world brought to the old uh, Oh, European the powers. flush. Sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, Spain and England and France and so forth, Portugal, and uh, the Dutch all just got enormously wealthy just, uh, you know, sailing around the world and trading. And so those same people, the masters of the world, uh, want to be able to do the same thing. Just, I mean, the, the, the wealth and the power and the knowledge that they could have accumulated by now is just unimaginable on a human scale. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, well, I what, what really I love... Where we, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I was going to say what I love about this program is, is I get to have so many different perspectives on the same, you know, genre of, of discussion. You know, you, you come from your perspective and your experience and you've met these amazing contacts. Um, and then, you know, Reed, who's coming on a little bit, has a very... Um, he has contacts of his own, but in a very, from a different angle. Um, and, you know, the messaging may be a little bit different, but the central piece in all this is that there seems to be something going on. And, yeah. um, you know, we're all just trying to, like, what's, the, what's the metaphor they use? Like the, you put your hand on the tail of an elephant and, you know, trying to figure out what, what it is. And one person's got their hand on the, on the hoof and, and so forth. 
So, or, or foot. And anyway, I'm not, I'm not doing very well with this metaphor, but the point is, <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling here. But the point and is, one has the tailpipe and so forth and so on. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, and, but, we're all, <laughs> but no one can really get the grip on what it actually is. Um, right. But who knows? I mean, uh, you know, may, maybe um, all these pieces will come together sooner than later, and we will figure this out once and for all. But Ken, I, I want to thank you so much for jumping in last minute and, uh, and saving me there. So I, you know, I appreciate you're always there for me and you support me and everything that I, I do. I did, did a live program for seven years, as you well know. So yep. <laughs> uh, I know these things happen. <laughs> indeed, indeed. All right, Ellen. Anytime. All right, thanks, thanks Ken. To everyone for listening. Take care. All right, and uh, yeah, Ken Cherry's book, The Stephenville UFO, can be found on Amazon. Definitely go check it out. It's a great read and uh, highly intriguing. Okay, so my uh, next guest and the feature of tonight's show is Reed Summers. Reed is the son of Marshall V. and Summers, who is the prophet and messenger for a divine revelation regarding humanity's emergence into a universe of intelligent life and the hidden reality of contact taking place in the world today. For over 12 years, Reed had been working uh, with Marshall as a teacher and representative for his divine revelation and for the Allies of Humanity briefings. We'll talk more about that as we go. Um, A revolutionary set of texts which reveal the secret agenda of those ET forces present in our world and provide a clear picture of what these forces are, um, why they are here, and what they are doing at this critical time on Earth. Reed Summers, are you there? Alan, I am here. Are you able to hear me? I can hear you fine. How are you? Okay, good. Good to be Fantastic. here. Fantastic. Great. I'm, yeah, I'm glad I got you on. We've uh, we've been working at this, uh, Tin and I, for for months now. And, you know, obviously my program went through some changes um, and I know you had some other things going on, so so here we are. I'm so glad. Here we are. We're finally having um, this conversation. Indeed, indeed. So, you know, it is an interesting conversation. As I was saying to Ken, you know, people are coming from different perspectives, and the central theme here is um, ET contact, no matter how you look at it or what, you know, research approach you're taking. Um, however, yours is um, more message-driven uh, so can you explain, you know, to those listening who are not familiar with you, uh, how you got involved with, or rather, no, not how you got involved, because we know it's related to your father, but um, why you got involved? You know, what was so important about what you were, you know, learning from your father and from these messages that you felt compelled to participate in this? Well, I remember being in high school at the ripe age of 16, and I went to hear a lecture by my father uh, here in Boulder, Colorado, uh, a public lecture on the Allies of Humanity briefings, which he had spent many years up to that point receiving and publishing and teaching about. And um, I was very much on the fence, and I had my own goals and ambitions in life, as you should at that age. And uh, I heard my father present the essence of these briefings. These are a set of documents Uh, given to him by a group of observers who have come to the vicinity of the earth to observe the extraterrestrial intervention in our world and report on it. And they have given a series of briefings to Marshall, and that was what he was presenting that day at the Mm -hmm. library here in Boulder to a public audience. I, I sat back and listened to my father give the essence of his communication, and I could feel within myself, this is one of the most important messages in the world today. This puts all the pieces together, so to speak. This completes the picture as to what our world is facing, Mm -hmm. what the future will be like, and why we're in the world at this time, and why some of us, probably those listening, feel an intrinsic, deep, undeniable connection to the reality of contact. More than an interest more than a curiosity, but a deep and abiding sense of connection. And that's what I felt at that moment. And that moment was a turning point for me. That's when I, at some, some, somewhere deep down within me, I said, I need to help Marshall present this to the world. Okay, well, and that makes sense in accordance with what I was planning on asking you, um, because what I wanted to ask you was, you know, why, why didn't you doubt any of this or, you know, or did you? And uh, I mean, because even if my father were to come and say to me, as much as I love and respect him, hey, um, this is going on, and messages from aliens, 
um, you know, I would still, I would, I, th- I would think that I would still pause and go, wait, really? Is that, <laughs> you know, is something well, else pause. going on here? So, yeah. I, I so, would hope you would pause. I would hope you would pause. <laughs> I would pause, and I, yeah. I certainly doubt it. Oh, for sure. No, no questions asked. I mean, I, I was stunned and amazed and bewildered and confused at what was going on at the center of our family. Mm-hmm. You know, for your father to be enveloped in this process of receiving this communication for Earth, why him? Why was mm. he chosen? How can we trust this? How do we know it's true? You know, these were the questions that all of us grappled with at some level. Um, and yet, I think it's the experience, actually, of being at the center of my family, seeing who my father is, which is a tremendously grounded, respectful, compassionate, well-educated man who himself did not pursue any of this. He did not have a personal interest in this. This came upon him. This kind of uh, overtook the reality of a normal family. And all mm-hmm. of a sudden, this bigger reality became, was revealed, and we realized, well, we have, to, we have to publish this. We have to bring this to the world. And we all grappled with it, for sure, because if real, if true, the Allies of Humanity briefings are one of the seminal milestones in human history when an authentic gesture has been made to the planet Earth from those who truly represent our best interests and are trying to reveal to us what is the greatest event in human history, which is the intervention by forces from beyond our world into this native planet called Earth. If that's real, oh my God, that's huge. And it was a journey for me to come to the certainty for myself that that was real. And I took my own journeys out into the world and had my own um, career experiences, educational experiences, and so forth. And I just realized that given everything we now know about UFOs, and abductions, and all the different phenomena surrounding contact, given all we now know, these sets of briefings are clear and true. And this is what is needed in the world, is a, is a clear assessment of the reality of contact, uh, you know, the biggest event in history. So that was my, that was, uh, that's my, not, my journey in a nutshell. Um, but there's more to say for sure. I'm sure that people ask you this all the time, um, but, you know, weren't you afraid of, you know, what would happen to your life if you went down this road and spoke of such, you know, seemingly outlandish uh, concepts. Hmm. Um, I don't know if afraid was the right word. Maybe, maybe uh, some sense that my life will be relegated to the fringes and I won't have that, that wonderful hit of social respect that you get when you pull, pour yourself into a respectable career. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I had those thresholds I'm sure. But when you realize that, something very precious and true and needed, needed by others. They actually authentically need this. Right, is in yeah. your midst. You're the son of the man who receives it. He's right there in front of you. He's real. He's not making any of this up. This is coming through him in live speech. He is dictating it. It is being transcribed, and that is what you see in the book. There's no, there's no, there's no premeditated message here. When you see that process, really like the process of revelation, which is Mm -hmm. a communication from beyond, is being transmitted through a humble man chosen for this task, why we don't fully know, and there it is, and you read this message, and you see the state of the world, and you know there are people out there struggling to make sense of that, and more than that, they came into the world because this was their calling. This was well, the great threshold of this time, and they can't make that connection. So seeing that, well, let's yeah, wow, let's talk I about what the, the message is, Reed. Yeah, but what what is the message? What is the core message that these you know beings are sharing through your father? The core message is that humanity is a young adolescent race in a larger universe of intelligent life, what they call the greater community of life. And we are at a critical threshold in our evolution and emergence where contact is occurring by forces from beyond our world. And yet it is not contact of a beneficial kind. It is intervention. It is just like the first contact that the natives of the new world face. 
contact with commercial forces, powerful interests with greater forms of technology, greater mm-hmm. means of influence. That is our so, current position as, yeah. Right, well, so then people um, are receiving messages and, and contact is happening now um, because there's some significant reason within our timeline. Why not, you know, a thousand years ago or 500 years ago, or have they? And why is now so important that they would just wait until now? Because goodness knows humanity has needed help for a long time. Certainly so. Well, the reason the allies are here is because the intervention is here. And the intervention wasn't here a thousand years ago or 500 years ago. The intervention is here now because of several key turning points, key moments in the history of humanity that we have reached, the advent of nuclear weapons, the ability to destroy the natural environment of the earth, um, and a global communications and economic infrastructure that the intervention, being a commercial force, can plug into in order to gain access to the resources of a rare, biologically rich planet in a universe of barren worlds. So that moment is now. That moment wasn't even 150 years ago in the Industrial Revolution or before. It's now. And the intervention is seeking to use this moment and all of its potential to serve their interests, all the while saying that they are enlightened beings here to teach us peace and help us overcome our differences and all that beautiful, loving language, uh, which we are very receptive to because we know how bad it is down here on the ground. And we know that we have been unable to solve the great problems of our time, climate change, poverty, religious violence, being just a few. And so they're attempting to use this moment as precious and pregnant a moment as it is for their interests. And that is something we have not been able to discern. When you go out there, go to UFO conferences, go online, see what people are saying on YouTube and so forth, they are not talking about an intervention. They are talking about government conspiracy and the need for disclosure from governments. They're talking about enlightened space beings who are here claiming that they fathered us, they own the planet, Mm -hmm. that they're better than us and can govern better than us, that they can convey technology that would liberate us from outdated economic structures that oppress people today. All these claims, okay, surrounding the core reality. And you mentioned early in the show you know, we're all kind of groping and reaching in the, in the dark, you know, trying to grasp this reality, this really big reality, the elephant in the room. And what the allies of humanity do is they turn the lights on. They say, it's not as complex as you think. In essence, it's an intervention. This is your moment of first contact. You are divided. You are um, overcome by... Uh, your own fantasies, hopes, wishes, delusions about who the visitors would be, let us turn the lights on and show you who's in the room. And who is in the room, according to the Islands of Humanity, are a set of predatory commercial interests, multiple, not just one, who are using influence in the mental environment, who are manipulating our religious beliefs, our spiritual aspirations, in order to gain access to people at many different levels. And so who are these that, people? A, are, they, are they calling them well, out? Uh, they don't call them by name because names don't mean anything, uh, not to us, um, but they absolutely call them out. They call them out for exactly what they are in the larger universe in which we live. And this is where the Allies briefings uh, offer a really amazing gift, actually, which is an expose of what affairs are like, political, economic, Mm -hmm. even military, in our local region of space, what we could not discern beyond us in our our local neighborhood in this galaxy is being told to us in simple and clear terms without a lot of cosmology and grandiose planes. Uh, It's the prosaic picture of what's around us, which reveals who's really in our world. Who's in our world are those who are willing to extend the energy, take the risks, journey the long distance through space, and to quietly interact with an unsuspecting and naive humanity who is absorbed in its own issues day and night, Mm -hmm. in order to be the first on the factory floor, so to speak, to get in at the ground level of what could be a great extraction event 
an extraction of the Earth's resources and us as a resource. And that's something we can talk about later. I, oh yeah, we should definitely talk about that later. Um, so who are these... Uh, is evil the right word? Who are these entities? What do they look like? Um, can you describe yeah. them to us? Mm-hmm. Okay, sure. Uh, well, they are physical entities. They're not multidimensional. They're not robots. They're not us from the future. You know, we think all these things, which is okay, natural. We don't know what we're facing. Uh, they are physical beings with vastly uh, advanced forms of technology that have been developed over tens of thousands of years through all the complex mechanisms of trade in the greater community beyond us. Mm-hmm. And um, they are, in a sense, scavenger races. They are those who live in space, who may not even have a home world, uh, who kind of squeeze into the edges and the cracks between societies and nations in space and try to play the card of the trader or um, the economic intervener, you know, one who can gain access to new resources and sell those to those who need them. And the allies, again, they provide just a mind-opening picture of life out there. It's not what we think. It's not a universe of love and light. It's not a universe where half the ETs are good and half are bad. It's actually nature. It's a prosaic universe, as you might imagine if you really think about it. Like, yeah, (laughs) it's, I mean, Earth is a part of it, and Earth expresses nature, so, you know, the universe might too. And and this is very liberating for those interested in UFOs, because without this perspective, we just project our hopes and wishes and needs upon them in, in multiple mm-hmm. fashions. Is it possible, though, if you believe in, in a metaphysical universe that has some sort of conscious super consciousness, is it possible that it may be prosaic like now in the way that you're describing it, but in the long run that there's like a demi-urge for the universe to evolve to a place mm-hmm. of light and mm-hmm. love? Mm-hmm. Well, very good question. And now we get into the reality of the new message from God, because Marshall Dion Summers didn't just receive these sets of briefings. Alongside them, he has received a divine revelation, really from an angelic source. And the purpose of that revelation is to prepare humanity to emerge into this greater community, which does have a spiritual destiny. And it is a spiritual reality as as much as a physical one. And so there's a divine revelation coming through, and there is a set of prosaic briefings about what we're facing now as the human species. And both of them are actually essential to understanding who's here and where we are in, in our larger evolution. Because indeed, as you say, of course, the universe has a destiny. You know, the new message from God reveals that the universe is simply the manifest, the manifest, But there are other levels of creation, all of which have separated from an original divine presence, God, the creator, whichever word you choose. Mm -hmm. And that is the universe we see and touch. But the important thing to understand here is that we are not making contact right now with spiritual forces. We are making contact with physical forces who have the same biological needs as we do to survive. Mm -hmm. And And that is what drives and motivates them. Now, there are spiritual forces in the universe. There are unseen forces, and the new message reveals these different levels of reality. But it's important not to confuse the level of reality that you're actually dealing with. And I think that's what I see a lot is people, they, they, they know this UFO phenomenon is real. Um, they know there's something behind it, and yet they leap beyond levels of reality to say that these are angelic beings, that they are enlightened, that they are, you know, levels beyond levels and in fact no there are neighbors in space or they they are you know the drug dealer down the street and you're stepping out onto the street for the first time it's really important you know who that person is on the corner and not trust them immediately or to give an even better analogy you open your door right to the city beyond your front door and there's someone standing there and they want into your home and you think, well, maybe I should know who you are. And if you're not invited, you should explain yourself. And I should sense out, you know, is that, is that trustworthy? Um, what are your intentions? 
why are you wanting to come into my home? Or, no, you can't come into my home. It, this is what we're not doing as a world. We're opening the door in the middle of the night and going up and going to bed. And we wake up in the night and hear people downstairs, and we trust blindly. We say, well, the universe is a loving, light-filled universe. I should be trusting. I should, I should express to those who have come what I wish to receive because I'm creating this reality. I'm creating through my expression, and therefore, if I express love, those who enter my home are loving. Now, stop for well, a minute. Since, yeah. and, and look at that mindset. Look at that mindset. That, that is such a precarious place to be well, within yourself, entering a physical universe. And well, that's what I wanted to ask you, too, is that since I'm struggling, apparently, with um, analogies and metaphors tonight, um, are are you saying that we are we are leaving our door open for these negative realities to come manifest by inviting beings that uh, unconsciously is that is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we believe that by what we hope for and express, mm-hmm. we can change who comes through our door. We can have good ones come through our door. But aren't these guys we, coming through our door? If we take negative, negativity out of ourselves then mm-hmm. the good ones will come. But these guys are that's, coming that's, through a door anyway, aren't they? Exactly. See, it's called reality, and reality exists no matter what you think or believe. Gotcha. And what's okay. really happening, okay. yeah, so I think we're on the same page. It's that there are many who think they can alter reality through mm-hmm. their spirituality or their hope and intent. It's not true. Reality is coming. You either see it for what it is, or you turn your eye away, you turn your blind cheek to it, and you wait for what comes. And that latter decision is the decision we are making as a world, partly because most people just don't know about contact. They haven't been told, which is understandable. And yet also partly because those who do know are tremendously confused and unwilling, by and large, to come to that honest position within themselves, which is, you know what? This is not a beneficial form of contact. People are being taken. Devices Mm -hmm. are being put inside people. Animals are being mutilated. There are hybrid people, individuals, potentially walking the world right now. Governments are being influenced. I mean, these are not the actions of a benign visitor. These are the actions of an intent predator. Quiet and Mm -hmm. clothed. Clothed in, in spiritual icons and spiritual statements of purpose but it's a wolf in sheep's clothing most definitely Uh, and the door is open and nobody's standing at the door asking who's walking through well can you expand on that what do you mean by spiritual icons and uh you know uh, wolves in sheep's clothing our own spiritual icons and things that we believe in are not what they seem they are being co-opted by the intervention and this co-opted. Is one so of the, the, the four, origin of them yeah. is, the, is the origin of them pure, and they've been co-opted, or is the origin of them uh, false from the beginning? No, I mean by and large, our icons are indigenous to us. You know, and some okay. of them you could mm-hmm. say are pure or divine, and some are man-made, human-made. Um, mm-hmm. But they, regardless, and some of them may have been introduced by the intervention. But regardless, we have to look at where is the vulnerability. You know, if you believe that. Jesus is coming back and we are simply awaiting the coming of this individual, the intervention will prepare an individual to meet that expectation. Same with the Maitreya, same with the Imam, same with the Guru, same with whatever you believe. And it's not Mm -hmm. that your belief is inherently flawed or bad, it's just that it's a vulnerability. And when you start to step back, you realize, oh my gosh, there are thousands of these vulnerabilities. And you can't patch them all individually. What we need to do is come to a very clear and sober and simple perspective as to what is going on. It's it's the elephant in the room. We have to know if it's an elephant. But do you feel like you know know what the elephant is? Do you feel like you have a pretty good grasp on it? I feel I have come to know because of the Allies of Humanity briefings and Mm -hmm. my own my own, you know, reading and, and investigation of the matter, my own conscious thought, for sure. And I didn't just believe the Allies briefings when they came upon <laughs> into my hands. But for those who are aware of this phenomenon and have been for some time, the Allies of Humanity briefings are our closure, in a sense. Closure of, of one phase 
of awareness and the opening of another phase of awareness. And what? I think many people are struggling in the first phase, which mm-hmm. is what is happening. And they can't get beyond it. They can't get out of the mystery of contact or they, they stand behind this, this demand of government disclosure, which is basically empowering the government, which will not disclose. Uh, and we're just going to sit around waiting for it to happen when, you know, the truth is at this stage of contact, which has been happening for over 70 years now at this in this way, we don't need government disclosure. We are beyond the point of government disclosure. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting because we have obviously different guests with different um, viewpoints on the show. And, and Ken, who was on earlier, Ken and I go back quite a few years now. And, uh, you know, I know his story pretty well. And he thinks that there are, in fact, you know, different factions within the government, um, you know, one of which wants disclosure. And there's this sort of you know, resistance to let that happen. Um, do you think that's a possibility in that that there are some people in the know that would like for us to, you know, to n- know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that's a almost so certainty not, that there are those in the government yeah. who know and want to reveal it. And and why why would their hands be tied? Do you think what what what's holding them back? Well, the intervention, because the intervention has been working with and around government with a plural, mm-hmm. with an S, because there's more than one government on Earth, and they don't, they're not on the same side, all of them. They've been working with governments for decades now, trying to establish favorable agreements in exchange for perhaps tokens from space, little bits of technology that mean nothing to them and everything to us, in exchange for the keys. And those keys, I'm sure, have certain stipulations regarding how and when uh, public mm-hmm. awareness can be yeah. shaped, uh, for their beneficial, you know, for their for their benefit, and I, I don't think, I don't know if the government is in a position at this moment to just out of the blue, based on the whim of whoever is in power at this moment, to let it all out. Uh, I think there's an acknowledgement that it would cause mass hysteria, um, that you couldn't control the response, and that's the thing is control. There is an intent to control, but I, what I want those listening to know, and this is what I've come to understand, is that. The source of that intent is not human. So we are, here we are berating our governments, criticizing basically ourselves as inept leaders and as corrupt. And standing behind that government is the intervention. And here we, you know, this is honestly, this is how intervention works. And we can see it in our own historical record. When the European powers came to the shores of the New World and landed their ships, they engaged in a number of activities which we can see perfectly mirrored today, although in a much more advanced form. One of them was to demonstrate and, and communicate a, a divine source. So the ET powers are certainly doing that. But it was also to establish liaisons with intermediaries within the tribal society and work through them. Let them be the government, but you're working through them now so that all the rage and anger is channeled at the native people's own power structures and the awe and the wonder and the hope is all conveyed towards the visitors. Now, let me ask, is that not precisely the rhetoric online on YouTube everywhere, which is, you know, frustration and ire at the human and awe and wonder and loving embrace of the ET. That's, that is 98% of what I see. Yes, I, I agree with you. I, but I do have to say, I feel like much of that is a projection by us, a hope on our part. Um, so, you know, mm. we take what we have and we sort of, you know, view it how we would like to see it. Um, you uh-huh. know, humans are hopeful. And uh, so I'm not saying that, I'm not necessarily saying that you're right in that uh, there's these purely negative forces that are trying to, to change us and that people are just flipping that and just turning it into something different and totally deceiving themselves. Um, what I'm saying is that there are other messages, messages out there from other people that um, are, are less, um, you know, resolute in, in that message and more optimistic. So it's easier for people to take those, uh, you know, hopeful messages or semi hopeful messages and, and, you know, and raise them up even further. And, and that's what people want. I mean, it's a, you know, no different than um, if someone, you know, back in the day, 
performs a, a so-called miracle or what seems to be a miracle, right? And then they catapult that person up. They raise them up and say, this is a miracle worker, and, and they worship that person. Um, mm. So I, I think, you know, that's a parallel for what may be going on here. If um, good, you know, good point, so, Alan. Yeah, I think there's, mm-hmm. there's our own tendencies to pl- at play here and our own – we have needs as Native people, and we have hopes and greater, greater <laughs> desires for life that we haven't fulfilled here. And so – we do. We, we we go out there with those in hand, and that's understandable. Right. Um, but there are so many messages out there. So, you know, obviously programs like this, which you've been on, you know, we have different people come on who have their own experiences with messages from ET contact. So, you know, are there, are there several out there? You don't have to name names, but, you know, are there several uh-huh. others out there that you feel like, huh, their message is, you know, near identical to mine. Maybe they're getting it from the same source. Um, and what about my follow-up to that would be, what about the ones that have a very different message? You know, how do we know whose message uh-huh. is the real message? Great questions. Um, well, you know, I have my own little rubric that I that I would use to discern an ET message, you know, for myself. This just came out of my own head. So uh, a few variables that I would look at. Is it verified by observable phenomena? You know, is the message that there's a galactic federation and that they're beaming some sort of love at us? Well, okay, that's not observable. Doesn't mean it's wrong. Just that's one data point. Second, is it plausible or is it outlandish? Because if it is outlandish or if it's expecting, like, belief in something that literally a human mind uh, would be hard-pressed to believe, then I don't know. I, I think that's demanding too much hope, and it's not explaining itself sufficient that we could trust it. Possibly. Well, I think, yeah, I think for most people, yeah. any ET contact messages is like, whoa, I don't know about that, you know? But, um, right. So I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah. Well, and just last, I'll say, does it empower or disempower humanity? Um, that's one, you know, big fulcrum point that the Allies falls on one side and, and many messages on the other is that the Allies are not in the world. They're not staying in the vicinity of our world. They're not extending trade agreements and federations for us to join. They're simply telling us what's happening and backing mm-hmm. away while calling for us to see it, to unite together sufficiently and raise awareness, of course, and to respond as a Native people. I mean, that's mm-hmm. incredibly empowering, and, and it doesn't, they're not asking anything. They're not saying, well, we're, we're giving you this empowerment, and what we would love is for you to. There's no, there's no hook. Um, there's no gotcha. There's no um, agenda. It's, it's purely a perspective that leaves us, the Native peoples, as divided as we are with the work we have to do. Uh, and I find that very empowering. I actually find it very challenging, to be honest, especially in the beginning. It's like, wow, this isn't what I wanted. And, you know, we all want things in contact. And that's, we have to understand that. Like, we don't come into this room neutral and impartial. You know, we have, we're in love with this because it's, it's bigger than, you know, the earthly realm. It's future-oriented. It's, it speaks of, you know, new associations with new forms of life. It's very refreshing. And life on Earth is not, or can feel very um, inert <laughs> or very distressing. And so we, we have needs and desires that, that we put upon this phenomenon. We say, well, I want this to be good. And, hey, I thought that. Marshall thought that. You know, it's a struggle to come to the truth because the truth is the truth no matter what you want. And um, that's part of the process that's underway for folks is, is – coming to that truth slowly over time, even if it's not what they wanted. For any of those just tuning in, yeah, really quick, just for any of those who are just tuning in, we're listening to uh, and speaking with Reed Summers um, to speak about the allies of humanity, their urgent message about the extraterrestrial presence in the world today. If you want to call in and ask him a question, the number is 657-383-0829. Again, 657-383-0829. And you can find out more about uh, read at his uh, his website, and that is readsummers.com. Really simple. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Reed. No, you just asked um, before, are there any other messages I feel out there that are authentic or, you know, 
um, consonant with the Allies of Humanity briefings? And then what about those I don't feel that way about? Well, um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a tough truth that you, the listener, has to discern the truth. You know, I hope you don't just believe me. You would have to go read the briefings and feel it out for yourself. And that's, that's what it comes down to. Is it comes, again, this is empowerment, right? This is not just saying believe despite what's there. It's saying go look at what's there and then come to the conclusion yourself. So um, that you said, think, I yeah. don't see many voices um, communicating with the clarity and the objectivity of the allies and that verify what's observed. Because when you look at the phenomena, this is not, like I said before, these are not the actions of a beneficial visitor. And all of the authors and speakers out there and channelers and so forth, um, I don't hear that in their message. And okay, so well, you know, we've are, yeah, of course, absolutely. Um, I'm with you and I'm hearing you, and I'm very concerned your message is a little scary, <laughs> admittedly. Um, even though there is a message of hope behind it. Um, let's go to our, our first uh, caller here. Caller, you're on the line. Go ahead. Hi. Hello. Uh, my name hey, is Alan. I live, I, live, I live in Texas. And I, hey, Alan. Um, Robert, Robert Stanley, uh, he's a re- UFO researcher and author. He turned me on to the Allies of Humanity about 10 years ago. And so I've had a lot of time, and, and uh, it made sense. To me when nothing else did and something that it talks about in there that I would like for Reed to address if he could was this um, idea of government influence and influence in our governments and you know moving the world into the direction that the intervention wants it to be moved because the allies of humanity speak about the hybridization program, which answered a lot of my questions, and I think everyone's questions, about what's going on with all these people being picked up and all of this um, genetic work that seems to be going on and all these reports of, you know, babies that are implanted and then stolen and what's going on with the hybridization, and they answered that to my satisfaction, and they answered so many questions for me. I had always been involved in or interested in, you know, conspiracy theory and New World Order stuff and the Illuminati, and I was always wondering, well, well, who's above the top of the pyramid? You know, if there really is this global domination thing going on, then mm-hmm. you know, what? Who's controlling the eye of the pyramid? And the and the Allies explained that, but there's a real important thing that I had to come to understand that while we as a humanity need to become unified. We need to become cooperative. We need to become sharing and caring. And so we need a, what I call, a new and improved new world order. And the one that is being projected out there right now for us involves technological controls. It involves the the reduction of our freedoms and the enslavement of humanity, which the allies tell us, is the goal of the intervention. So they have their minions on the ground operating for them, and these are the guys. I'm like, wow, that explains it completely for me about this kind of the negative. And, again, it's they're co-opting. You know, we have the natural urges. This This is our natural evolution to become a unified world eventually. We have to become cooperative. Well, other. Alan, we I, I, mean, I, I hope so. I hope so, because there is a lot of division yeah. going on right now. Well, that's yeah, that's a that's a perpetration too. That serves that all of the all of the splits and the divisions. And right now, we see a tremendous split, a, a polarization, and there's so much that is perpetrated because the more confused, needy, violent, uh, chaotic we become, you know, from the chaos, we will create the new world order. Remember those words, George Bush. It's like chaos serves the purpose. Yeah. No. Yeah. So anyway, Alan, I mean, I'm just, you're, uh, you're, yeah. Go ahead, Alan. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I just wanted to, you know. Oh, oh and the one other little thing was you asked about why now, and it was not only are we becoming needy now because of our own chaos and uh, confusion, but technolo- technologically we've become 
available for them to reach the world, to have worldwide access to everything. And they, the Allies actually say that radio was sort of, they implied, interjected into the minds of Tesla and Marconi to hasten the technological development, which led to RTTY communications and then fax and then telephone and, you know, telephone and fax and then Internet. And so now mm-hmm. they have the net, the network that they didn't have before, and they couldn't have done it before until that happened. So anyway, well, I don't want yeah, to show no, that's right. You're you're really familiar with the Allies of Humanity. Do you do you have a specific question for Reed at all? Yeah, yeah. Um, do the do the hybridization programs that are going on, you know, all the stories of abductions and all that. Do you feel that that um, that that is act, is going on for the purposes of putting people in government? Hmm. Well, the Allies of Humanity make very clear that that is the case, and not only in the halls of government, but in the halls of commerce and religion. And the hybridization program is something that uh, is revealed in Allies of Humanity Book 2 and 3 uh, more extensively. And it's dark, uh, and I grant that. It's certainly not the message we wanted. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the truth we wanted, but the truth is the truth. Um, and to answer your question, uh, yes, individuals are being trained and prepared to enter into these halls of power with extraordinary psychic abilities that will certainly woo and impress those around them and gain these individuals quite the prestige. But the core truth that cannot be overturned is that their allegiance is to an off-planet power. Their human allegiance is not fully intact. Their genetic makeup is not fully intact. You know, so this is, this is, it's dark. And um, the hour is late. And that's why those who are listening are so important, because the allies of humanity are calling to people of conscience. They're calling to people who know that this phenomena is happening and is real. And not just to educate them more so that they understand, but to show them that there's a reason why you feel the need to know this. It's because your purpose for being in the world, your direction in life is connected to this. You're not just meant to be some person out there with a job and a life and a family reading about this at night, you know, going through websites, watching interviews, trying to understand. It's, it's, it's about what would you then do when you understand? Do we have the courage to understand? Or do we want to keep this a mystery? Because clarity then implies action. It implies doing something like what Marshall did, which is this is real. You mean I have to become a part of communicating this and supporting this at a broad level? I mean, this could overtake my life. And I, I, I've had stuff like that as well. And yet you have to feel out, you know, are you, are you meant for this? Are you meant for these times? Are you a greater community person, as the new message calls it? Hmm. Uh, someone who is intrinsically connected to life beyond the world, and they feel the calling to reach out to that life. But they have to do it in the right way, in the wise way, not, not impulsively. They have to do it with the wisdom that is now coming into the world through both the allies and the new message from God. And that this is precisely why the new message from God is here, is because there are millions of people who are not only people of conscience, but they are greater community-connected people. The earth and its concerns and its ambitions and its many identities are not enough for them. They've never felt like they could fit in and just adopt that and say that that was their life. There was something else. And it's been urging and biting at them. There are millions of those people, and those are the people who will be the forerunners for the human race as it emerges into this greater community of life. Alan, uh, thanks so much for your, for your your call and your question and your, and your comments, too. Um, and it's, you know, it's nice to bump into an Alan every once in a while. There aren't many of us out there, it doesn't seem. Um, I... I I do wonder about this because I don't have a good grasp uh, read on what is going on with the supposed hybridization because one has to wonder, um, could any of us be some sort of, you know, fourth generation byproduct of some sort of, you know, I don't know, genetic, uh, you know, experimentation that's going on. Um, You know, where, where does it start and, and, 
where does it end up? Mm. Well, that's what, what is the origin of this whole thing? What is the end game? And mm-hmm. are we a part of shaping Can the end game? We, right. Or are it, we, are yeah. we caught up in that? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Great question. I mean, there are individuals walking the world today who are already in the halls of power who are the product of this intervention. That is a sobering thought to think. And it is the truth. As I've come to understand, it is the truth. Mm-hmm. And so what stage of this are we in, you might ask? You know, uh, where do I fit in this? You know, what next? And those are great questions. And this is exactly why the new message from God was given, because the new message is much bigger than the Allies of Humanity briefings. The new mm-hmm. message from God is many books in length that reveal a pathway of preparation that people can take to prepare themselves at all levels, really, to be greater community-oriented people, to be people of the greater universe. Uh, And so that's the preparation that needs to be undertaken. And so when I say we don't need government disclosure, I say that because, oh, it would be great. It it would be very validating, wouldn't it? It's just all of a sudden it's public knowledge that contact is real. Wow. Absolutely. What would that end up doing? What would we do with that? Would that firm a greater side of us, a greater pathway of development and preparation, or would we become the happy victors in our own defeat? Well, I always thought it would be a a unifying, a unifying uh, happening. No, that we would all kind of like like an Independence Day. It's like, oh, you know, we all better work together because there's something else going on here. Wow. Uh, but we've got a second caller in here, Reed. I'm going to get them in. I want to keep them on hold for too long. Um, caller, are you there? Hello? Hello? Yes. Hi. Hello, are you there? You're on the air. Uh, yes. This is David in Kansas City. Hey, David, um, how are you? I've been listening. To... I'm great. Thank you, Reed. I re- and, and you are really... Uh... <laughs> Opening up a fire here in me. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> Go then, uh, yeah. Don't don't hold you back. Know. Don't hold back, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I tell you, I've been uh, following this for since 2012. Mm-hmm. I heard Marshall on uh, Kerry Cassidy's channel, and um, it just it struck a chord in me because ever since I was a kid, I've known there is something going on that just was not normal. And I think a lot of us are really feeling this right now and uh, responding to it in some way. And uh, we're looking for, you know, some sort of answer. Um, and, you know, as Rita's saying, is to find out how do we fit into all of this and discovering this kind of thing um, because it's completely new. <laughs> and it's, well, what, uh, When it's you say serious. it's completely new, what, what's completely new, Dave? It's new to our experience. I mean, we've never been at this threshold before. I, I mean, if you look at it from the perspective of emerging into the greater community, I, I, I didn't even think about that when I was younger. I thought, well, Star Wars is a cool movie I get to watch on television. Well, could this actually be real? <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, but at the same time, it, it, it really um, – it, it, it angers me. I get very frustrated sometimes, um, you know, hearing that some of these things can be going on, and especially around intervention. And uh, I wonder what the heck can I do? And other, other, not just the 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 things with um, the uh, hybridization program, but uh, in the mental environment. Um, mm-hmm. And people, how we can be influenced in the mental environment. And that was one thing that I did want to ask Reed, uh, and that has to do around being influenced in the mental environment. And perhaps just to, like, you know, mention what, what, what is actually happening there. And from what you can see, I mean, because I have my ideas and what I've observed. And then how can we offset that within ourselves and then within the world? Okay, Good thanks, question. Dave. Yeah, go ahead, Reed. Yeah, that's that's something that I think about often, and it's it comes from the the plain truth that is presented in the Allies that simply by there being non-human intelligences in the world, that considerably affects the mental environment of the world in ways we don't understand, and partly explains why the world feels the way it does. You know that that fever pitch, that rising tension and sense of discord. In, in the mental environment. 
which then the new message speaks on further as, as real. It is as real as the physical, is the mental, the world of thought, and how thought influences thought. And we know nothing about this, right, you know, or very little. And so it is a new frontier. And um, I'll just contribute one thing, you know, for that, I, that I have taken to be very important is it's important to be aware of what's going on in your mind because you are not the source of everything that goes on in your mind. And that's always been the true, the case, though we didn't know it, that other humans influence us, you know, that we actually think thoughts that did not originate with us, that were actually, that entered our mind through osmosis, you know, uh, that's been happening forever. But now there are directed intent, there's a directed intent to change how people think, to change their proclivities, to thicken their skin, to dumb them down, to make them more acquiescing and less suspecting or more distracted and diffused. Okay? And these are a direct result of the intervention. This is part of what they are doing. It's called the pacification program. That's what the hours of humanity call it. And so this is out there in the environment. It's as if we're fish in the sea and the chemistry of the sea is changing. You know, there are things floating in the sea that weren't floating in there 10 years ago. That is true. And so here we are day after day. And an important truth that I've, that I've come to, uh, to teaching in the new message, but I found it very important is to recognize when something is not you. Because if you don't do that, you will internalize it. You will ascribe it to yourself. You will say, oh, I'm a negative person. I have negative thoughts. Or I'm an obsessive person. Or I'm a, uh, a person who thinks like that. And then you start to struggle with yourself. You, you've internalized that. And now it's you, you think. And now, you know, and now that starts to distort how you view yourself and what you pursue in life, which, by the way, is what the intervention would seek as an outcome, is it would distort how you view yourself and what you would pursue in life. Um, and so simply by acknowledging, and this comes through awareness building, becoming present of mind and becoming a student of knowledge, which is something I'd love to talk about in a bit, uh, you begin to build that presence of mind and that awareness of the mental environment you're in. And you can stop and say, what was that thought? Where did that come from? I'm not so sure. Maybe that wasn't me. Maybe that mm -hmm. was from the mental environment. And it's not to say you're going to obsess over that and start, you know, <laughs> pulling things out of the air. Um, but it's a more objective way of being with your own experience, actually. It looks maybe right. more subjective at first, like, wow, now you're saying that that thought came from an alien source or that thought came from, but really, and, and you could go there. You could, you could become obsessively subjective. But what I'm talking about is becoming more objective, less caught up in yourself and more the observer of yourself, okay, so that you can work with your experience in a very turbulent environment. Because if you can't work with your experience, if you can't even stop and be still and present and acknowledge the thoughts you're thinking, you're being swept down river. Well, I mean, I think that's true in, current. yeah, I think that's true in just general psychology. Dave, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. So when you mentioned you had a, a fire, um, you know, built up in you or, or, you know, came, came up, what, what do you mean by that? What's, what's the cause of that? Do you think? It's just, um, with all of this going on, it's like it, it's like been building up in me for a very long time. It frustrates me because, um, in a way, it's like it, it feels like there's a lot of work. There's a lot of um, it's a lot to deal with. You know, it's um, and I, I don't think I'm the only person that feels this. Um, in, you feel you feel that the it, world it, it, has a lot of work, or yourself. Well, just just when I read the Allies of Humanity mm -hmm. and, and even other texts around this subject, it it fuels a fire in me. It's like uh -huh. there's it's like I ha I need there's like there's something I need to do here. Uh -huh. Like I feel this draw to it, and and I don't really know how to how to put it. I don't know what it means mm -hmm. for me, um, but but that's there. I'm acknowledging that's there. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Dave, for for tuning in and and uh, sharing your thoughts and, and a question. Um, so, uh, Reed, you know, I do want to address that because you know, 
you, there are these messages, right? And um, we haven't spoken about all of them yet. Uh, but, you know, what, what do we do? I mean, there's this major sense of a division and uh, within, obviously, the United States, but you see it all, all over the world, especially politically. And, you know, from my, my perspective, what I see is a mo- multiple movements happening, all deriving from social media. You know, the, the social media has given, you know, agendas and ideas fuel and um, have got people together that otherwise may not have coalesced. And so we are getting major um, fractions within our conversations as a people. And I think that looks very human to me. Um, obviously, you know, Trump is, is a very divisive figure, whether you, you know, like Trump or not. There's no denying he's very divisive. And, uh, you know, there are other people with other agendas that are also divisive. Are you ad- attributing any of that to these allies, these, um, these alien beings? Well, uh, to the allies, no. The allies have given their briefings, um, and, and they, have, they have departed the vicinity of our world. So they have told us what we need to know, although they are still speaking very infrequently, you know, very infrequently. But, but I guess my question is, um, um, you yeah. know, do you, does it, can their message be sort of co-opted and mixed up? And, and you know, any message sure. that is put out there just gets mixed in the human mind, you know, and uh, put on puree, and then you have something else. I mean, you know, how much of it is really our fault versus, you know, other alien species with different agendas? Sure. Well, good question, and, and, and very astute. I think you're really right, Alan, that the Allies can go right into that blender and get blended with all sorts of other stuff, and we think we now have it, and we don't have it, you know. And so that's a very that's a very important truth. Um, I don't feel that a lot of what we see in the social sphere is directly the result of the intervention yet. I wouldn't be surprised if that were to change in coming years as their agenda becomes more advanced, as the hybridization program becomes enters its le- more later stages. Uh, I, I see turbulence, as I'm sure you do. I see upheavals. Some of them are needed. Some of them are great. And some of them are a sign of the psyche of the world. They're a symptom of, of the malady, so to speak. Um, now, the malady isn't really the intervention. The malady is the condition of our planet Earth and its people in relationship to the universe beyond it. That's, mm-hmm. the, that's, that's that throbbing need. You know, basically... The, the, the outdated religious viewpoints that are fueling religious violence, okay, or these, um, these highly divisive movements that are championing xenophobia and paranoia and returning back to isolationist times, you know, departing the global order, vilifying the global order. Mm-hmm. These are probably reactions deep within, you know, the human psyche to the, the amount of change and the speed of change, both of them, the amount and the okay. speed at which things are changing. Now, what's precipitating that change, what's, what's putting on the, uh, the accelerator, is the intervention and what the new message uh, calls the great waves of change, which are, is this convergence of forces, many of them created by us, including climate change, overpopulation, resource depletion, the loss of arable land, um, the limits to growth. We are, we are reaching the maturation of developed economies. What next, right? What happens after a service economy? Who knows? And, and we're enamored with all the possibilities of self-driving cars and the new green economy. Much of it very important, very valid. Um, but we are racing towards a unknown future at an ever higher pitch. And I think that is what you see in some of these more reactive movements or progressive movements. Right. It's, and, you know, to, to add it's, fuel it's, to it's the fire. Yeah. And, and but, the, you know, the irony here is I feel like adding fuel to the fire, at, which we alluded to earlier, is um, this idea. Um, and we're learning this apparently from the allies of humanity that um, these entities wish to cultivate the earth. You know, forget about all the, you know, on top of all the damage that humans have done ourselves and our own misgivings amongst each other. Now there's this other entity that wants to pillage the earth. And you alluded to, uh, you know, something to do with taking us and cultivating us. 
Um, uh-huh. What what exactly? I mean, that's a scary uh-huh. a scary thought on top of everything else we have to worry about. So, what exactly do they want to do with us? Yeah, well, there's there's layers, and it depends on how deep you want to go. But uh, you know, the first caller uh, spoke of the mother of all conspiracies. Marshall has spoken of the great conspiracy that nobody is questioning. And that is the agenda of those ET forces who are highly active in our mm-hmm. world. They're not just watching. They are in the mix, and they are not revealing their intent and, what, and, and, and their actions. And so this is, this is really the conspiracy behind conspiracies. And, you know, this is that, that itch you can't quite scratch, that pee underneath the mattress you can't quite identify. You know, it's, it's the thing beneath the things you see. And um, that agenda is made very clear. The light has been turned on by the allies. The room is lit. It is an intervention, and their purpose is the Earth and its resources, the strategic position of our world, which we would know nothing about because we don't know what, what strategy and, and, and what position we're even in in the local universe in which we live. And then third, it's the resource of humanity. And the allies, uh, allies book three, goes into this deeply. And it is disturbing. Um, it reveals that we are a source of biological materials in a universe where biology rarely emerges, develops on its own in any time frame that can be utilized. You know, blood plasma, the, uh, the substrates of human skin, um, organs, bones, and beyond. All of that is a tradable resource in a universe where many races are space-dwelling, Terrestrial worlds that are abundant in life are rare. And so here you have 7 billion intelligent, you know, sort of, in their view, intelligent (laughs) beings that can be resourced. So essentially harvesting. Yes. Right? I mean, harvesting human parts. And and I I guess, like like you said, we don't, you know, we're not out there, so we don't know necessarily what, good those parts are to other other beings but um it's just it's a pretty uh, you know horror, horror horrific thing to think about but you know scientifically we we can graph and grow organs in labs now so i just wonder you know why 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 would any being want to do that to us when if they're advanced enough couldn't they just grow organs or something some other parts elsewhere uh apparently not uh, apparently, nature has developed substances that are very hard to replicate in, you know, labs and controlled environments. And mm-hmm. I, I can imagine that there are very few intelligent races that are willing to give up their own kind for experimentation, for parting out, uh, and so forth. And we apparently are willing. That's what we're that's what we're demonstrating. Not because mm-hmm. we're ignorant, but because we're we're not educated. People don't know this is happening, and I know it's very dark. Uh, but this is the prosaic universe we're entering into. This is how big this moment really is. This is not the, the, the contact phenomenon and all of its side phenomena are not just uh, an interest to be entertained. They're not just entertainment or something new for us to go read about. We are coming in contact with the other 99.99999% of reality, of life. And this is what life is like. Not all life. It's not all bad out there like this, but... Mm-hmm. This is what first contact is. And if we put off the day where we reckon that and we keep entertaining the next theory about the next government conspiracy or election or so forth, or, you know, tapping our foot for disclosure from our own, you know, higher ups in, in, the, in the human realm, we're putting off the day that we kind of get honest about the reality of what we're facing and ask the most important question, which is asked by the second questioner, what do I do about this? Like, really, if it's this big and this dark, what do I do? And I think that's one of the, mo- one of the most important questions. Well, and I think he tapped into something that many of us, like you said, are probably feeling and is like, okay, I, I have to do something, right? This fire has been lit, um, but I don't know what to do. I feel, I feel helpless. And when you feel helpless, it's um, less likely that you're going to feel hopeful. Um, sure. So while the allies of humanity are giving us um, these, you know, uplifting 
uh, encouraging messages. Um, you know, it's when you feel like you still can't do much, then it's hard to feel hopeful nonetheless. Um, you know, so any of us on a day-to-day basis, I mean, what do we do? Do we meditate? Um, do we, you know, you know, apply for FOIA um, documents? I mean, you know, what, what can actually make a difference for the individual on, on a daily basis? Oh, well, a lot. And I think it's important to, to just acknowledge just for a moment that we're facing, we are the first people to become aware of the biggest turning of the tide in human history. Okay, so this isn't going to be an overnight fix. This isn't a self-help seminar. This isn't, you know, to make you feel good and happy in your life now. This is big, and you're one of the first to know about it. Now, what does one of the first people to know about something this big do? And how do they get out of overwhelm? Great, great question. So important. Um, Well, first, they need to gain the full awareness. And that's why the new message from God is in the world. Because if if the situation... Uh, wasn't so dire, there wouldn't be a new message from God. But the situation is so dire. Just just by stepping back and looking at how far behind we are in recognizing this, that is why God has spoken again. The creator of all life, giving a new revelation to all of, to all of humanity to help humanity through this transition, the biggest transition in our evolution potentially, yes, that's what's happening. That's actually who Marshall Dion Summers is. He is the man who has brought that revelation into the world. And it won't make sense why that would be needed unless you, you get the full picture, kind of like we're getting now, which is how big this is, how dark it is, and how few there are who are responding. Um, so the new message from God, in a way, is the answer for those who are becoming aware of this and are asking that question, what must I do? It's like Frodo in the ring. You know, it, Gandalf just... <laughs> took the lid off and, and told you the full picture. And it is like, mm-hmm. what? Oh, my God. Wait a minute. I did, maybe this isn't real. Maybe, wait a minute, there could be some flaw in this. I'm not so sure. And, you know, and I understand that response. That's fine. But there's something within the person, there's something within that says, mm, no, this is your calling. This is calling to you, not to the person next door, down the street, but to you. And that is interesting. Why it is. I mean, that's very interesting. Lord of the Rings is my favorite story, the trilogy of all time. Um, Yours too, huh? But, but for, yeah, oh yeah. Um, I'm going to yeah. start actually posting some videos on our YouTube channel as well and sort of expand, you know, beyond just the paranormal news. But, um, you know, this, this thing that Frodo was, was dealt, he at least he had something, he, he knew what he had to do, right? I mean, he made the hard mm-hmm. decision. It wasn't easy. But he knew, okay, I have this one mission. Um, you know, whereas the rest of us, it's, you know, it's much more vague. But I, I understand what you're saying. There's a hope. But, you know, what is this God? Um, you know, you're, you're saying God. What is this God? Uh-huh. Well, this God or creator or divine presence uh, is the creator of all life in the universe. It's the great mystery. This is not the God necessarily of an established religion in the world. You know, this is this is the great presence that stands behind life, that seeks to move life, as you said, Alan, earlier, all life in the universe towards a loving and light-filled destiny, bringing all of separation back slowly, world by world, people by people. And the creator of all life recognizes that our world stands at the risk of misjudging this threshold of contact and losing our freedom either partially or completely as a result in becoming an enslaved race in a greater community of life and losing thus the potential to express the power of knowledge or spirit that we all possess and which actually is our purpose for being in the world. And so that is the creator that has brought this revelation here. That, that is the creator that's been at work throughout human history and throughout the greater community of life. And part of the purpose of the new message is to reveal, to re-reveal what God really is. Not the deity, not the angry father. No, a greater mystery that, that is moving all life in the universe towards a unified end. But that needs to speak in relevant terms to the needs of a, of a world now. And that, that is what the new message is doing. Well, you know, it's interesting because, and we mentioned Lord of the Rings, and 
You know, I've been uh, talking a lot about that in Star Wars lately, and you know, I think about the Force, and you know, you know, if someone told us what the Force actually was and turned it into some description, um, you know, maybe it was you know aliens or something, it, it would the impact of the films would be deflated because it mm-hmm. is the mystery of not exactly knowing what the Force is, kind of feeling it, sure. getting a sense of it. Um, it empowers you, it inspires you. Um, but that's only yes. because I think, uh, for the most part, I, I could be wrong, it just may be far bigger than I can comprehend if we uh, you know, think about it, but it, it's the mystery that makes it a wonder. And, um, you know, so in this case, I, I understand what you're saying, but, you know, there are a lot of people that are good people that are atheists or, or Gnostic, mm-hmm. agnostic. And, uh, you know, so what about them? You know, if... You know, good-hearted people that just don't believe in uh, this God, uh, are they okay, too? Can they participate? Absolutely. God works in many ways. And there's a truth in the new message that has been on my mind a lot recently and that I think is one of the greatest truths ever, ever. And it is God does what works. So if someone is an atheist, God does what works. They still engage that person, absolutely, in the, in the greater plan. And... Or, or maybe someone of a religion you wouldn't approve of. But you know what? There's a universe of religions we wouldn't approve of. There are, there's a universe of races that are like, that do things that would be abhorrent to us, but they are still being given guidance from the creator of all life. They are, this mystery is still moving in them. And so this mystery is bigger than we think. And it's moving us. Hey, this is the fire that the second caller spoke of. That fire, this is it. It's the fire of knowledge the fire of the force or what when you ask me why did i do this with my life why did i take the risks join my father why did i do this well you know what it was knowledge this reality of knowledge within me that is why i did it. i did not do this for gain you can imagine or for prestige and i did this knowing there would be conflict and discord as a result of presenting this in the world most certainly i'm not doing this for myself i'm doing this because i know i must do this and I don't fully know what I must do, but I just have to keep going. And I think that's how we often feel knowledge is, is just this kind of quiet force pushing us forward and telling us, no, don't go there or don't give yourself in that relationship. Keep moving, keep moving, keep searching. You know, this is, this is the greater power of God reaching out all over the world, getting people into position to discover their unique form of service to the world that is entering the greater community that is stepping over the threshold out into the larger city of life. And many people are meant to be a part of that. And they, and I, this is where the hope is. This is, this is where the answer is, which is that many people must be reached with this, this clear, this clear message about the intervention, about the state of our world. And they need to begin taking steps to discovering and feeling this force of knowledge within themselves and to move with it. Maybe it says move to this location, take this job. I don't know. It's because they have a unique nature and design to serve the world at this time. And it greatly needs to come forth from them. And so the answer, the solution is sleeping within tens of millions of people right now. The question is what will awaken it? What will call it out? And can the person take the journey to fulfill that? These are, these are open questions that I can't resolve. Um, but, you know, the, these, this well, is what stands yeah. before the person who feels that fire. And these beings that are intervening, these ET beings who have their own self-serving um, motivations, which would adversely hurt the human race, um, they're a collection of just one sort of a race, if you will? Well, they, Is that you, correct? You actually, mm-hmm. use, you actually use the word that the Allies use, collective, that they, they call them a collective mm. of different races merged into one hierarchy uh-huh. uh, that serve a number of different interests in the vicinity of our world, but, and there are more, there's more than one collective in the world. There's actually a competition, almost like a competition between England, France, and Spain for, you know, for new territory. There's there's competition for this emerging world, um, and or yeah, like Mexico the and with, the uh, no go ahead I'm sorry in Mexico and what 
I, I was just thinking football. I have a uh, European football on my mind. Oh, so I've been, oh, yeah. We've been rooting for Mexico, but go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, but this intervention most certainly would not want us to respond to the level of conscience or spirit. Mm-hmm. That's why they promote um, messages that deny negativity, fear, which are by the fear, by the way, that's a human emotion. That's, that can be a warning of danger, by the way. <laughs> it actually has a role. Um, but messages of total acquiescence, total complacency, acceptance, love, and so on and so forth. They, they, these are basically disabling people night and day from their own conscientious response to the state of the world. And yeah, we don't feel so good about the state of the world, but we need to feel that because that feeling leads to something, leads to action. It leads to doing something. And the new message, this is what it's calling for. It's calling for people of conscience to take the journey of steps towards gaining access to this knowledge, this deeper innate sense of what you must do in life and to then take the steps of doing it. So and, it's about taking that is how the world, yeah, it's about taking the steps. Right. I see. And, and it's so about it's not like out against the intervention. Right. And it's not a like, like, and I'll use this example just because we spoke about it. You know, if I want, you know, Mexico to win the world cup, I can't just sit there and meditate and put all my force of intention on it. And I'm going to bend that will into existence. It's a really, it's about, it's about action in our everyday life. I understand that. Um, and, you know, I hope that, you know, the allies, you know, do help us, um, you know, assuming that they are indeed real. And I hope that's the case because mm-hmm. humanity really could use some help right now, as we mentioned. Um, so, Reed, I, I want to thank you again for coming on to the show. I'm glad we finally, you know, got to do this. Um, if you want to find out more about Reed Summers, go to reedsummers.com. That's R-E-E-D-S-U-M-M-E-R-S.com. And uh, Reed, do you have any um, speaking engagements or anything else you'd like to share right now? Oh, nothing on the docket at the moment. Um, but I'm sure I'll be out there, Marshall's out there. And, and what I really recommend is go search Marshall Beyond Summers on YouTube. Go hear what Marshall is saying mm-hmm. and see if this resonates. Read the Allies briefings, see if they resonate. Um, because if they do, it's a major rendezvous in life. You know, you, you, this encounter doesn't happen often. You don't encounter what could be the key to finding and fulfilling why you're in the world every day. You know, this is a rare encounter. So I pray that for those for whom this is happening, that they take that next step. All right, so we'll leave it at that with a message of hope for everybody. Thanks, Reed, again for coming on. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate this a lot. Good to speak with you. Right. Okay, take care, Reed. Thanks. Okay, so I want to thank again uh, Dave and Alan for calling in. And Dave, thanks for being so candid and uh, honest with, with uh, how you're feeling. We really appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody who supports this show on social media and tunes in every week. Um, you know, we're looking to expand the network. We're making moves. Things are happening, and we will be growing little by little. So I'm glad that you're all part of that process. And, um, you know, don't forget to tune in next week at the same time, 9 p.m. EST on blogtalkradio.com. And, of course, you can always follow me on Instagram. That's at Paranormal Now or on Twitter at Paranormal underscore Now. And, of course, on YouTube, um, which we are trying to expand that platform as well. And um, you can just go to Paranormal Now on YouTube and you'll find that. It'll pop right up. Um, all right. Thanks again, everyone. And um, until next time, live in the mystery. Be well.
Honda 4th of July sales event has brilliant deals on our most popular vehicles, like the Civic, Fit, and Pilot. It's a reason to celebrate across the country, from the Liberty Bell to Hollywood, and even back up to Niagara Falls. So come discover the 2018 KBB.com Best Overall Brand during the Honda 4th of July sales event, now at your Honda dealer. Based on 2018 brand image awards from Kelly Blue Book, visit KBB.com for more information. Yeah, I walked the dog, gamed a little, played with a frog. What does your morning commute sound like? Hi, welcome to McDonald's. Can I get a sausage McMuffin with egg and a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit, please? Kids back up, went back home, and I went to... Here you go, Jim. Here's to making your morning routine a little better. Right now, mix and match two select breakfast sandwiches, like a bacon, egg, and cheese McGriddles, a sausage McMuffin with egg, or a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit for just $4. Breakfast at McDonald's. Single item at regular price at participating McDonald's for a limited time.